tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. A seed planted today takes root and grows into a tree that bears fruit in the future. Over 110 years ago, a seed was planted. Today, that seed, the idea of excellence, has grown into the University of Pretoria, South Africa's largest contact research-intensive university. Nine faculties and a business school are spread across seven beautiful campuses, which are home to over 50,000 students, ready to make an impact in the world beyond university and join our global network of nearly 300,000 alumni. Future-focused, sustainably developed facilities and cutting-edge multi- and transdisciplinary research are underpinned by a desire to transform lives and have a positive impact on communities and the world. Excellence in teaching, learning, research innovation, arts and culture and sports puts us firmly amongst the world's best universities. Knowledge is not just what is in books, it is the wisdom to apply it. To nourish and nurture the seed so that it takes root, grows tall, bears fruit and branches out. UP plants that seed, that tiny bit of curiosity, creativity, critical thinking, hope, the desire to care, respect, help and innovate against all odds. To grow, to leave your mark, to excel, to challenge the norm, to think, to rethink to discover, to inquire, to lead, to have courage, to make a difference, and to persevere. This is the University of Pretoria. We make today and every day matter. Good day. Uh, my name is Norman Duncan. I'm the Vice Principal Academic at the University of Pretoria. Um, and I'm also the Program Director for this, the 28th lecture in the UP Expert Lecture Series. Um, as you know, the lecture will be presented by Professor Margaret Chitiga Mabugu, uh, the Dean of our Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. Um, in the context of the pandemic and of the deliberations at the recent 20, uh, 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, or COP26, the topic of Professor Chitiga Mabugu's expert lecture requires attention now more than ever. I now hand over to Professor Tawana Kupe, the Vice-Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, to do the welcome and to introduce Professor Chitiga Mabugu. A very good evening, morning, and afternoon to those who are listening from other time zones. Professor Margaret Chitiga Mabug was appointed as the Dean of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at the University of Pretoria with effect from 1 August 2021. She was the Executive Director of Economic Performance and Development at the Human Sciences Research Council prior to joining UP as the Director and head of the School of Public Management and Administration on 1 September 2014. Professor Shtiga Mabugu was previously a professor in the Department of Economics at UP. Her PhD in Economics, which she obtained at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, focused on the economy-wide impacts of public policies on income distribution. Professor Shtiga Mabugu is rated by the National Research Foundation as a C1 researcher and conducts research on a variety of developmental issues. She is primarily interested in analyzing the impact of policies on society and the economy at large. She has published both locally and internationally and has co-authored more than 20 client research reports. In addition, Professor Shtiga Mabugu has supervised more than 20 PhD and MSc students. She is a member of the Stockholm Environment Institute Science Advisory Council and the Academy of Science of South Africa. Professor Shtiga Mabug is also co-chair of the International Technical Group for the Climate Action for Jobs Initiative and a member and a scientific advisor 
for the Partnership for Economic Policy Network. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Professor Shtiga Mabugu. Professor Shtiga Mabugu, your audience tonight. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, for that introduction. And thank you, too, for this opportunity to present my lecture. And as Prof. Duncan said, at a very opportune uh, time when we have just concluded COP26 uh, uh, deliberations in Glasgow uh, a few uh, days ago. It's, it's a great privilege, privilege for me to be uh, talking to you about the implications of a green economic recovery for South Africa. And, and I hope that I can entice you into, uh, um, a, 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 shall we say, activistic uh, way of uh, continuing and pushing forward uh, ambitions for us to green our economies. What I want to do first is simply just to set the scene very quickly in terms of a current state of climate change, uh, just to give you or to remind you those who are already working in this field of the global picture but then quickly go to the uh, context for South Africa. I'm aware that there are others here joining who are not in South Africa and, of course, would want to get a little bit of background uh, around South Africa. I will show you, or hopefully uh, convince you, that South Africa is committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and, and I will talk a lot about these greenhouse gas emissions. So in this case, then, our, our modeling was asking the question about opportunities for a green economy in South Africa. And, and I'll show you some of the modeling results uh, that have come out uh, very, fairly recently in the work that we have done. It would be an omission on my part if I did not emphasize the importance of a just transition if we are serious about greening our economies. And then I want to end with some concluding uh, messages. So firstly, in terms of climate change and the globe, it is a reality. As I am here in this room, I can tell you it is extremely hot, although it is already 6 p.m. here in South Africa. We have seen even worse results of climate change. So it's true that climate change is here. In fact, the IPCC report released recently has shown us the, the gravity of, of the increases in temperature that have taken place uh, between uh, um, 1850 there and uh, currently 2020. That spike in temperature uh, is concerning, and, and it is uh, really the impetus uh, that gives us the, the, the wish and, and, and this uh, um, desire to do research in the area that I am working on, together with a few of my colleagues. What is even more concerning from the IPCC report is that the majority, if not all, of the impact of this spike in temperature is anthropogenic, meaning to say it is caused by us humans. So, of course, if we are the causes of this climate change and the devastating impacts that we see uh, from climate change and that we anticipate in the future, if we continue on this trajectory, it is imperative on us to do something about it. And we hope that uh, the contributions that we make today would be a, 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 some way towards thinking in that direction in a very uh, concerted manner, in a in an hopefully urgent uh, manner as well. So in the sense of South Africa, uh, probably a lot of us know that South Africa is a big polluter. It is counted within the top 15 uh, emitters of greenhouse gases in, in the world. Uh, although it is not emitting as much as the big uh, emitters like the US, like China and so on, it is still within the, that, that range, uh, meaning to say there is concern. But what is probably not very well known is that in terms of per capita uh, CO2, that is carbon emissions, South Africa ranks way above average. And it's actually uh, ranked much higher than the, the 12th position. So this means that the emissions that we release in the atmosphere per each individual in South Africa is way above average. This again tells us that perhaps there is something we must do in South Africa in order for us to offer our contribution to reducing the impacts of that spiking in temperature that I, I showed at the beginning. In South Africa, electricity generation is the biggest contributor to uh, these greenhouse gases. Uh, these, these are the gases that are contributing to climate change. 
contributing in the above 40 percent but this is also then followed by industry and, and then uh, um, by transport and agriculture and smaller contributions from other activities and because it is electricity generation which is the biggest contributor it, it also turns out that it is carbon dioxide contributions that we make uh, uh, into um, the atmosphere I say contribution, although it is not a good thing. So 85% of the gases that we emit are a carbon dioxide. Well, is climate change possible in South Africa and indeed in the world? And what does it actually mean? So firstly, I just want to, sh to share the components very broadly of a green economy. A green economy requires that we be resource efficient it requires that we be socially inclusive. It requires that we have a low carbon uh, way of, of development. If we were able to do this in South Africa, and indeed in the whole world, we would have this picture uh, that you see there on my uh, right hand side, maybe left for you, where we have a sustainable planet. We have economic, uh, um, shall we say, sustain sustainable economic growth, and we also have a, a sustainable social development. What this means is that there is harmony between the planet, between the economy, and between uh, people, so that we have an acceptable, an equitable, and a viable economy. The planet, in this case, would be able to be saved not only for us today, because we are already experiencing the impact of climate change, but very importantly for our children and their children uh, going forward. So perhaps there is a persuasion for us to think green and to seriously think about a green economy. So just in terms of a definition, there are probably many, but uh, one that is uh, capturing the essence of a green economy is a system of economic activities related to the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services that result in improved human well-being over the long term while not exploiting future generations, sorry, while not exposing future generations to significant environmental risks or ecological scarcity. This definition captures it all. This is what we aim to achieve if we talk about a green economy. South Africa has no shortage of understanding of a, a green economy policies, and indeed no shortage of ambitions. I just here list a few of, of the documents in which we see evidence of this. So, for instance, very, very uh, um, specifically, the medium-term strategic framework of 2009 to 2014 was very clear in terms of the pathway that South Africa wants to pursue. The new growth path, which was a document that doc dominated for a while, is also very clear about the importance of a green uh, 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 development process in, in South Africa and therefore green growth in South Africa. The integrated resource plan is a, is a very important document because it shows what is planned by the government together with other uh, uh, partners, of course, in an economy in terms of movement uh, from one uh, um, place to another in terms of years and, and, and the planning of how our uh, resources are going to be used and how we aim towards reducing our contributions to greenhouse gases. The Industrial Policy Action Plan puts this into practice, so it tells us exactly what needs to happen. The National Strategy for Sustainable Development and Action Plan is another uh, document that also allows us to see the thinking behind some of these policies, behind some of these ambitions. So does the Green Economy Summit report. A document that is extremely important is, is a document that is called a, a Nationally Determined Contribution a, a Report. So these reports are submitted by, by many countries uh, to, 
to the, the convener of this just ended COP uh, conference, the UNFCC, if you have seen these abbreviations, uh, this is an, a UN body uh, a framework convention on climate change. And, and they are the ones that then see the ambitions that countries are advancing in terms of uh, reducing their contributions to greenhouse gas. So before, uh, I'm glad to say that South Africa has, in September 2021, just updated its NDCs, uh, so showing uh, even deeper ambition, showing that we are more ambitious than we were in 2016 when we produced that first report. I uh, borrowed this uh, uh, diagram because it, it makes it uh, very clear what, what uh, the, the, the ambitions for South Africa are and, and of course gives us hope in some senses in terms of where we might be going in if, if we, we stick to, to this plan. So here uh, in, in that grey area uh, on the screen you, you, we, we are tracking what South Africa had as ambitions before the updated report which is showing us the, the, the strategy and the thinking of the government together with other partners, obviously, that we will firstly peak in terms of emissions there in the neighborhood of above uh, uh, six, uh, 600 there on the, on the graph, uh, metric tons of CO2 emissions that is emitting those into the atmosphere. We will then plateau and eventually we start to see a decrease after uh, several years uh, in terms of our contributions, our negative contributions to the atmosphere. With the updated plan, I'm very pleased to see uh, uh, in some senses that they, there has been a change or, or a rethink or at least a continued ambition uh, in South Africa. So you see that by 2025, the peak has now reduced to 510 uh, metric tons of CO2 emissions to be uh, uh, the top, the, the maximum, with the, with the uh, lower limit still remaining as it was in the 2016. Uh, so there is a 17% reduction in, in the emissions that we had initially wanted to emit into the atmosphere. This is good. This has to be loaded. What is even more interesting is that by 2030, the ambitions uh, uh, promised in, the, in this uh, nationally determined contributions is that we would uh, have a peak of 420, which represents a 32% reduction from what we had uh, promised uh, in the 2016 report. And, and for me, in, in, in very exciting is the lower limit, which is actually falling outside of that band that had been uh, previously uh, promised uh, in, by South Africa in, in 2016. If we stayed uh, uh, close to that lower band, we would be able, in fact, uh, to, to make a contribution towards ensuring that temperatures do not rise above 1.5 degrees. This is the agreement now, uh, and, and it was uh, even emphasized at the just-ended COP26 um, a meeting that we have to ensure that we do not contribute emissions that lead us to above 1.5 degrees. This is not only dangerous uh, for us, but certainly, most certainly for the future, for our children and their children after, after, after us. So in terms of the integrated uh, uh, resource plan that I mentioned earlier, you can see once again the ambition of South Africa, a, a, very, a very encouraging picture there that South Africa, uh, comparing 2019 to 2030, is looking very decisively to, to shift the mix in terms of energy. So, so while coal is uh, at the moment the dominant uh, supplier of uh, energy and electricity in South Africa, the plan by 2030 is that there would be a mix wherein uh, solar and wind are playing a much bigger role, as you can see. The end result is a contribution to electricity, which is a, a much more than we have at the moment. A colleague was just telling me that although we have enjoyed a few days of no load shedding in South Africa, it's coming back. So, so this kind of picture tells us or promises us or gives us hope that we can move beyond these uh, terrible load shedding uh, uh, events that are causing uh, or additionally a reduction in, in uh, growth at the very least in our economy. So despite all these uh, promises, despite all these ambitions, unfortunately, the evidence in South Africa is not that encouraging. 
if I just give you this picture showing the, the improvements or the contributions of renewables between 2013 and uh, 2019, you can see that little green uh, area in the screen, they're moving very slowly, increasing very slowly, and coal maintaining its dominance in terms of contributions to electricity. This is a concern. And I hope that with our research and other research that is taking place uh, throughout South Africa, we, we are showing uh, uh, that this is not the way to go and uh, that there is a better way uh, uh, for South Africa. We are therefore not surprised to see that the, the last ranking for South Africa in terms of energy, the energy transition index by the economic, uh, World Economic Forum shows that South Africa is not really seemingly serious about transitioning to uh, uh, reducing substantially emissions that they emit. For instance, it is ranked 110 out of 115 countries in the world. This is not a good picture. This is not what we like to see for South Africa. Obviously, with the, 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 the recent um, NDCs, with all the, the praises that we received at COP26, we hope that this picture is substantially uh, improves. And we know that South Africa is indeed moving in, in these uh, directions. Clearly, there are some challenges uh, to delivering sustainable and affordable energy while improving access to energy security. We do not want to deny this, and I do not want to trivialize these challenges. However, we have seen that there is a, an increase in momentum towards wanting to find a different pathway. So after we have been decimated by COVID in South Africa together with many other countries, in uh, October of 2020, the president of South Africa, uh, uh, Mr. Ramaphosa, uh, delivered or launched his stimulus package. Within this package, it was very clear that he and his uh, uh, government were telling us that it is time to move away from business as usual. That we need to seek a more sustainable way of growth that allows us to have pro-poor results and pro-environment results. And this is actually prompting the research that I want to share with you just uh, shortly. So there is momentum, there is appetite, there is ambition in South Africa to move more and more towards what is known here as net zero emissions. Simply put, it just means that by 2050, South Africa is one of the few countries, uh, big emitters, that is, that is promising that by 2050, the amount of emissions that they uh, release in the air is counted by the amount that uh, comes uh, back. So that in, t in, in, in uh, terms of emissions, we're contributing zero, so therefore not pushing uh, temperatures as we, we have seen in, uh, in, the, in the diagram that I showed uh, earlier. Of course, reducing emissions is one way to get us to net zero, uh, which is uh, really the point of the, uh, the contribution that I'm making uh, today. This I don't even need to go into to tell you that there is no shortage of evidence of climate change impacts in South Africa, in Africa, in Southern Africa specifically, and throughout the world. I mean, we have seen in South Africa uh, temperatures going up. I just mentioned uh, that right now it is extremely hot in South Africa, and I have no doubt that part of that is a contribution of uh, the, the many, many, many decades of uh, us damaging the, the environment. We have seen uh, uh, floods and, and storms and droughts that are exaggerated uh, compared to, to what we should be seeing or what we had previously uh, in terms of uh, uh, climate change change. We have seen, therefore, that this has meant that we have lost moisture in the soil, for example. This is devastating for crops. We have lost crops. We have water restrictions. Right now, I was listening to the radio, we know that there are some areas that are, are, are already suffering water restrictions. And, of course, this has a huge impact on a food and water security, to say the least. We, therefore, have no choice. To do so, but to do something about greening our growth. And this brings me now to the modeling that we have done. 
I want to focus on, on uh, so I want, I've got four, four um, sets of, of studies that I want to talk to, but focusing on, on the one, the first one. So of course I want to focus on this one because it's speaking very directly to the issues that I've just talked about now. This is work uh, that, that is within the area uh, that I'm very passionate about, which I've been working on in the last 10 years, and it is uh, conducted in this case uh, together with a group of other uh, institutions and bodies, particularly Cambridge Econometrics, whose model was used for this work, and I'll say a little bit about this model, but also together with the United Nations Environment Program and the ILO's Partnership for Action on Green Economy. The idea was to use this uh, econometric model, which is a global model, but where we can extract South Africa and start to tease out a certain uh, uh, potential for South Africa's growth. So the beauty of these models is that it allows you to do scenario analysis. So it says, what happens if we did this? What happens if we chose this way of growing rather than another? If, if our production was in this direction, uh, what would happen? So, so then, uh, uh, in terms of that, we were also, of course, uh, looking at what has happened due to COVID-19. And as I mentioned, looking at the, the launch of the stimulus package uh, from our president uh, in October of uh, 2020. So using all these uh, ideas, we, we, we then simulated, and I will show you what we do. In this particular study, we focused on energy, electricity. Electricity, I said already, is a big problem in South Africa. It is the biggest polluter, but at the same time, we do not have enough of it. So we focus on energy, understanding what happens if we invested in renewables and at the same time, therefore decarbonize and therefore contribute less to the atmosphere. Is it a threatening way of growth? Is it true indeed that while we want to save the environment, we would be uh, uh, um, compromising growth? and most definitely compromising jobs. We wanted to find out, we wanted to offer credible evidence in terms of this. So, so and, and also to offer specific quantified evidence in terms of this. And the model, as I said, allows us to then ask, if we went into, the, into a non-green pathway of, of development, or a brown way of development, the usual, so we go back to business as usual uh, after COVID, what happens? But if we were to go green, what happens? What are the differences? And I will show you the results just in terms of three uh, specific, shall we say, variables, uh, economic uh, a variable, a social variable, and an environmental uh, variable in terms of what our results are showing us. This is the team that was uh, working on this particular uh, first study that I want to, to present. Again, as I said, majority are uh, uh, modelers from uh, Cambridge Econometrics. So what was the backdrop in terms of our modeling? The idea there was, of course, to, to remember that South Africa has, an, an, and other countries too, a unique opportunity to recover. The question is, how are we going to recover? Are we going to recover in the usual way or not? We know that because of COVID-19, we have fiscal constraints, meaning to say the amount of money available to government has dwindled because there was a period, a long period, when there was no production, so there were no taxes. It's just to name one of the uh, sources of revenue, the main source of revenue to government. We know too that there was a decline in investments during uh, that whole uh, one and a half years or so of COVID. And we know this was happening in South Africa even before COVID. South Africa, too, is unfortunately uh, challenged by three big issues of poverty, inequality, and unemployment, which have dogged this country for so many years. These have been exacerbated by COVID-19. And I will say a little bit about this in terms of the research that we've done as well, just simply confirming this together with others. And this is uh, obviously now public knowledge. At the same time, we saw for a very split uh, second when we were not producing uh, or not producing as much as we did, that the environment was able to breathe. It gave us a picture of what is possible. It gave us a picture of what is possible if we are ambitious. We are capable of releasing less greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That's what we saw. Of course, that was not a good picture because it meant we are saving the environment at the expense of production. 
That is not good at the expense of jobs and exacerbating poverty, inequality and unemployment in South Africa. This is not good. So our modeling was saying to us, we want to understand over the long term uh, what are some of the environmentally sustainable ways that would give us prosperity. So we're not thinking that in order for us to save the environment, we must reduce our production. Is that possible? That's what we were asking. This is just to remind us of, of uh, the situation before COVID where we can see a, a, a downward trend in terms of growth. We have been trying to, to fix this for many, many years in South Africa. How can we grow? How can South Africa grow? And how can it also, as it is growing, the few moments that it, it grows, also increase a, a job creation. The green line there shows us that unemployment has been going haywire in, in South Africa. This is not a desirable position that COVID found us in and just simply made this picture worse. So in terms of our modeling, <clears throat> and I don't want to belabor the actual uh, uh, techniques in terms of modeling, we can talk about that uh, maybe even outside of this uh, um, a meeting. F firstly, I just want to, to mention the various steps so that you can understand once I start sharing the, the results with you. Firstly, we, we, we simulate, okay, we want to understand what would have happened in South Africa if we had not had COVID-19. It just helps us to compare the results. So therefore, after COVID-19, what do we see? And secondly, after COVID-19, with the stimulus package that is coming from the Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan that I mentioned that was uh, launched by the President in 2020, what do we see? If we go conventional, so non-green uh, uh, stimulus uh, measures, what is their contribution to the economy? And with those three variables I mentioned, GDP or economic, social and environmental. Well. Within this plan as well, there was an emphasis on what we call here in South Africa public works employment programs. These are temporary uh, uh, work opportunities that are uh, availed to people who are unemployed uh, simply so that they can earn a, a, a little bit of income in the short term, hopefully gain uh, skills that would allow them to then get more permanent jobs. This was emphasized. It's a temporary measure. In, in fact, in the stimulus uh, package, it's simply a five-year commitment uh, to, to really boost these public works employment programs. And then we have green measures also in this uh, stimulus package. So it was extremely uh, encouraging to see that the government was thinking that we, we need, it is time for us to move uh, uh, to more aggressive uh, green growth. I say that, but at the same time, we did not think that it was aggressive enough. So in a third step, we asked, what if we pushed green growth? What if we have what we call a green push? So this is outside of this ERRP, but it allows us to be able to inform policy, to be able to show police what happens if we were to really be serious, bite the bullet and go green. I will not go into this. These are all the, the different numbers that we use for, for modeling the baseline, which is what happens uh, if we did not have COVID and then uh, the COVID scenarios as well as the, the ERRP. Program. And here is where I want to <clears throat> spend a little bit of time to explain what we did. So out of this plan, we teased out different components. So for instance, we wanted to know what was it that is being committed to conventional policies by the government. And these are such things as infrastructure investment, where the government was very clear that they would contribute 10% of the funding to stimulate this, but the majority of the funding has to come from the private uh, sector. There's also a pronouncement there of localization, of stimulating tourism, of uh, food vouchers, among others. And the bill that was given that we teased out of these uh, uh, specific issues out of the plan is in the neighborhood of around 835 billion rands over a 10-year period. 
in terms of public works, we also wanted to separate and see the additional impact of public works. The bill, as you can see, or the, the cost or, or the amount of expenditure there is much less, 68 billion over five years. I mentioned already this is really a temporary, a, a temporary boost where uh, opportunities would be created in agriculture, in education, in health, in public administration. We know this is already happening in South Africa. And then <clears throat> green elements. And, and our focus, as I mentioned, was really on renewables. So it is clear from the plan that uh, the government uh, the policy uh, going forward or the stimulus is really to say we want to increase uh, uh, or to subsidize uh, renewables. So, so uh, allow uh, independent people, allow businesses, even ESCOM as well, allow uh, private uh, investors to come in and boost that, those renewables. In addition, as we, we increase renewables, we have, of course, to take care of the grid. So we need investments on the grid so that it can accommodate uh, renewables. We must also invest in energy efficiency, uh, at, the, at least at the household level. Uh, but uh, this is uh, really can go to other uh, sectors as well. And in, important and interesting was restrictions on new call investments in order for us to meet that IRP 2030 uh, graph, uh, uh, pie chart that I showed you. The only way that we can get to the reducing coal-fired electricity is by uh, putting a cap in some senses or restricting, in, in any case, new coal investments. So these three components are now part of the, the uh, ERRP. And the budget, as you can see, for green uh, growth is 190 billion over 10 years. So different uh, budgets, perhaps different priorities. Then our green push was saying, what if we added to this 190 billion an additional 300 billion? And once I, again, I said uh, the, the beauty of these models is you can simulate this so that you can give better advice to government. So, so this uh, 300 billion further push is not coming out of ERRP, but is for us to show what is potential in South Africa where we to be even more ambitious than we are at the moment. Again, in, it is investment in renewables, in the grid, and, and certainly limiting annual investments in coal-fired plants to the current levels. That's what we modeled. And here are the results. <clears throat> so in terms of business as usual, we normalize that line on top there, that grayish line. I hope you can see the distinction in colors there. Simply to, ask to, to assist us to understand what would have happened if we did not have COVID, so that we can compare all other results to this. So the first thing to notice is that a, a broken a dark a line showing us the impact of COVID. In that top uh, left-hand corner, I'm showing GDP. We saw clearly, and we know this already, that GDP fell quite substantially. And even recovery, if there is no stimulus package, will take a long time to get us even uh, back to where we were before. But with the stimulus package, that is that A there, and starting with the conventional, so the non-green uh, stimulus, we can see that the economy is uh, uh, substantially boosted. Uh, in particular, we see that the pathway to growth is very different from that on COVID. It actually leads to, to increases in GDP and indeed to, to faster uh, recovery than uh, is the case without a stimulus. If we add it to that, a, a public works, we can see that there is an even boost to, to uh, growth, to GDP. And if we further added the green elements so that A plus B plus C show us that indeed we are moving closer and closer to where we would have been if we did not have COVID. This is, of course, very pleasing. This, is, this means that the stimulus package has a, a, a very um, good impact on the economy in stimulating growth in South Africa. But look what happens, and, and uh, here the distinction is that a sea blue, uh, sea green light line is, is a stimulus package a component, whereas that forest green line is our green push. Our green push is actually what enables us to quickly get back to where we would have been without uh, COVID. This is interesting. So by pushing our ambitions, 
going even greener, we are contributing quite substantially to growth. Then I want to come to the bottom of this uh, uh, picture and talk about employment and unemployment. So as I mentioned, one of the biggest fears of greening is simply that we lose jobs. And you know that there are debates about this and, and uh, decarbonizing will, will uh, um, mean that some people will be stranded. Uh, never mind capital that would be stranded. What we show in this, uh, what we found in our results is again comparing to business as usual, the devastation in employment uh, uh, in that uh, right bottom uh, uh, picture is clear, and we have seen these numbers already. Recovery takes a long time back to pre-COVID uh, um, employment numbers. The, the, the other uh, figure is simply just mirroring employment, so it's showing unemployment, so I don't need to explain it as well. But the, the stimulus package, the blue line, the conventional growth, the non-green, does indeed allow us to gain in terms of employment. So once again, it's a very good plan uh, in terms of uh, growing the economy. Public works uh, contributes uh, uh, to the extent that it can as a temporary uh, measure to employment. And indeed, the sea green light line, which you can see there, shows that indeed that green stimulus also assists us to get even more jobs than previously. But what is very, very interesting for us was to see that in fact, in net terms, we are able to see that the green push allows us to get more employment, allows us to reduce unemployment in South Africa. This is critical. And I say in, in net terms deliberately, I want to come back to that. Let me go to the top uh, uh, right-hand corner there, where we also show a variable in terms of the, uh, the environment. What, what do all these things do to the environment? Firstly, business as usual, we can see once again that uh, gray uh, dotted line normalized at zero. And we see that small uh, uh, improvement that we saw in the atmosphere due to uh, a lockdown, due to no production, which I already mentioned is not something to celebrate. But we see very, very, uh, I hope you can see clearly that because of the stimulus, we are quickly going back to CO2 emissions that we emitted in the atmosphere before COVID. While we are seeing a contribution to growth, while we are seeing a contribution to employment from A and A plus B, we clearly see as well that we are going back to damaging the environment. The line, the green line <clears throat> that is showing that is part of the package gives us some relief because it shows us that, in fact, adding those green elements that is increasing renewables and, and not adding more coal has a, a potential to lead us to less emissions being emitted into the atmosphere. So we are, in essence, decoupling the environment uh, effects from growth. The two do not have to be opposing each other. We can contribute to growth, we can contribute to jobs and to the environment. But very, very happy for us, look at what happens with that forest green light line. It's clear, we can see this, that we can push even further the reduction in CO2 emissions that we emit into the atmosphere. While at the same time growing, while at the same time a, a building employment. Again, in net terms. So I could even say here at this point, green growth is not just the right thing to do, it's in fact the best thing to do. I mentioned that I wanted to, be, to emphasize the fact that we are looking at net jobs. And, and we can see from, from that, sorry, it's very small numbers, I wanted to put it all in one, but we can see that extractive industries are losing uh, employment. So, so it's very clear that there will be some losers if, if we were to decarbonize, if we were to move away from fossil fuels. And so, so what do we do? We have to ensure that if we were to go in this direction, we must have what is known as a just transition. I apologize if I appear to be sweating. Please forgive me, it's very warm in here. Again, 
more reason for why we should go in this direction. So in net terms, it's clear to us from our results that we are able to accommodate those that lose jobs. What's important, as I said, is to ensure that we have just transition. And I want to come back to this uh, towards the end. Just very quickly, I want to summarize a, a research that has also come out of uh, three other uh, papers or research work that we have been doing related to these issues. Uh, firstly, just understanding what if we pushed further this whole green uh, idea? What if we said uh, South Africa can also contribute to resource efficiency? So using our resources efficiently, apart from just uh, the energy story that I talked about. So we, we simulated here more efficient use of water, for example. We simulated a change in activity in terms of the industry so that we are uh, using less brown activities. Okay, so on the consumption side, is there something we can also contribute so that our overall uh, uh, contribution to devastating our planet is even further reduced? In addition to that, we worked with my colleagues as well, looking at, firstly, just we wanted to understand the impact of COVID at the beginning to see which sectors are impacted, which people are impacted. And there it was very clear to us that we, we have to be very careful when we look at COVID. Because what has happened is that there is now a new poor group that has been created because of COVID-19. Whereas we had the traditional poor group, we have seen certainly that those people who have lost their jobs in industries that shut down, uh, those people who could not be able to telework like some of us uh, have lost uh, their jobs and did not have social grants in front of them. So they were the new poor that were created. It's important to mention this because that whole story of just transition needs to consider, need to, needs to be aware of these types of uh, um, events, these types of changes that will occur in terms of the poverty uh, uh, picture in South Africa. We saw too in, in another uh, study that uh, women and, and girls were uh, disproportionately uh, impacted by uh, COVID-19 for, for several re reasons, uh, least of which is that they, we, we know that there are entrenched inequalities in social norms in our societies, which led to women being the first ones to go in terms of employment and being constrained to go out to go and uh, do their informal work a uh, way that is um, applicable. So I will not uh, uh, go into this picture. Again, we can come back to, to this for those who are interested in the actual modeling that we did. In this particular models, uh, we use what are known as computable general equilibrium models or CGE models for short. These are economy-wide models that allow us to see what happens at the uh, firm level, at the industry level, at the household level, and that also allow us to see what happens with different agents, with the government, with firms, with the, the rest of the world, and so on, so that we have an integrated idea and picture of what happens when policies are instituted, or in this case, when shocks hit our economy, such as COVID-19. So as I've already said, we saw very clearly that we need to, to be careful about that group of uh, workers, particularly those who are unskilled in terms of labor and those who uh, have less than primary education. They were really devastated by the impact of COVID and they are likely as well to be the ones that are impacted uh, the worst by uh, decarbonizing and by moving out of coal towards renewables. We saw too, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, the stimulus package, that it is possible for us to, to grow at the same rate, even with using less water, even with changing our activities to make them greener. So apart from renewables, we were able to see with, uh, from our results that using, see, looking at that yellow line, uh, it's possible for us to produce the same ab amount of output with less water, for example, at the industrial uh, uh, level. Why is this important for South Africa? I already shared with you, and you all know this, that we, we are a water-stressed uh, country here in South Africa. In fact, 50% of the population in South Africa live in water-stressed areas. And yet, 
what is uh, disappointing, and, and I'm of course also a culprit in, in, in all of us, is that per capita, the amount of water that each one of us uses is way above the, the international benchmarks. So we are water stressed, but we are overusing water. So clearly there is a potential for us to be able to uh, use uh, less water in our, in our production. And the good news from our results is that we would still be able to produce at least the same output. So clearly, it means that with more water, more investments in water, we would be able to produce more in South Africa. Once again, giving us that whole uh, uh, um, confidence that we can go green and grow more and grow better. So what are some of the points that I want to just leave with us uh, as I come uh, towards the conclusion? Uh, well, this research, we believe, offers support for the importance of climate and environmentally uh, friendly policies as part of an integrated government response to mitigate and recover from the economic effects of COVID-19. This is a extremely important now just after COP26 uh, and with all the praises that South Africa uh, uh, received and with all the pledges uh, uh, that South Africa uh, has received as well from COP26, we have a way to, as we say in the university, uh, uh, to reimagine the way that we grow. We have an, a real opportunity to try something new and our results show that if we did that in earnest, remembering uh, to, to take care of those that would potentially be left behind. We have an opportunity to change the course of our development in South Africa, and I believe in other countries as well, uh, in, in Africa at the very least. So these results can, of course, be used for policy. Uh, this is part of the, the work that we do. We are very interested in, in sharing something that has policy impact. We think that it can contribute to uh, resetting ourselves in a way that is pro-poor and pro-environment while we prosper within South Africa. I said that I wanted to come back to this whole issue of a just transition because it's critical. If we do not get this right, we will get resistance in terms of uh, uh, decarbonizing, in terms of emitting less, in terms of going uh, towards a more green growth. So it's important for us uh, in all these policies to be very clear in, on the pronouncements of a just transition. We think it's important to remember that uh, we must ensure that there is decent work and gender equity is extremely important. We have seen that green jobs are possible and they have the ability to eradicate poverty. And I use eradicate deliberately in South Africa. We know for sure that they lead to environmental sustainability, moving us as well as the world towards net zero emissions. And this brings us back to that picture that I started off with, the planet that we want, where we have sustainability, coexistence between the environment, the economy, and people, where we have equity, where we have uh, viable ways of growing, where we have bearable uh, uh, changes that are taking place around us, making sure that we do not leave anyone behind. This issue of just transition uh, brings me to just share with you that some colleagues of mine in the University of Pretoria are, are working very hard on, on uh, pr several projects to now start to look very closely and again within this integrated framework at the just transition pathways that are possible for South Africa. So it is uh, uh, perhaps another lecture that I'll come back to some years uh, to come or one of my colleagues comes back to that. But at the same time, I also want to share that we are working very, very uh, um, hard to, to come up with a, a center that is really focused on women issues. So from a transdisciplinary point of view, we, we think this is absolutely critical and we have contributions to make in this regard. And then just very importantly, in another two weeks or so, uh, on the 2nd of December, we are launching a very, very exciting center uh, for the future of work. Just transition issues feature within this kind of uh, research. We want to understand in the future what are the jobs that are available.
those people who are losing jobs, what happens to them in the long term? Can we prepare them now for the jobs of the future? So, so that whole center uh, of the future of work, which is being launched shortly, is going to be research-based and allow us to talk about these issues, among many others uh, that are important for the future of work. The importance of the just transition, just, uh, I wanted to emphasize once again this, this uh, idea. And, and a few years back, uh, together at the invitation of the uh, International Labour Organization, together with a few of uh, colleagues there at ILO and, and um, other institutions, uh, had put together a very, I would say, almost simple book, a guidebook on how to measure and model social and employment outcomes of climate and sustainable development policies. This book has now been used in more than 100 countries where, where policy makers or uh, organizations were preparing their nationally determined contributions in order for them to have quantitative evidence of the implications of greening their specific uh, uh, countries and therefore being able to own the, the determined or the promises that they would determine in, in nationally determined contributions. Let me come to some conclusions, uh, simply just repeating uh, what I have said, uh, but really I want to emphasize that uh, the economic recovery from COVID-19 uh, offers uh, uh, South Africa in, in a rare opportunity to change course uh, and to tackle climate change. This is important. We know, I've, I hope I have convinced you if you are not at all uh, convinced about this. The results from our modeling, which I've presented here, suggest that there is an opportunity to build back better and more inclusively. Most certainly, green recovery measures can, at the very least, do what brown uh, uh, recovery does. But we saw, in terms of, that is in terms of growth and jobs, but we saw that they do more they actually help us to curb environmental degradation. So once again, as I said, this is not just the right thing to do, it is the best thing to do. It is important for green uh, economic policies to guarantee a just transition. No one must be left behind in this uh, um, um, ambition in this, uh, if, we, if we were to, went, to go uh, again ambitiously towards a green uh, economic recovery. I didn't uh, present this now, but part of the modeling of the first results that I presented was also a team working on biodiversity to understand and to remind us that even as we go green, we must be very jealous of not uh, decimating biodiversity in South Africa. You, you may or may not know that South Africa is one of the richest countries in terms of biodiversity. And as we go green, we have also, just as we must ensure just transition, we must ensure that biodiversity conservation is key in all the policies. These are just some of the references uh, that I wanted to share with you. And with that, I want to thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. Thank you, Prof. Duncan, and thank you to the listeners. Mabugu for that very, very instructive uh, presentation. Yes, certainly there are aspects of what you said that has one very, very worried. But then, of course, I mean, you also point out how one can develop hope for oneself in the way in which one intervenes with some of the intractable problems that you have identified and spoken about. Uh, Prof. Chitika Mabuga, unfortunately you're not done yet. There are questions from the audience and I've selected two uh, simply because um, that's all the time that we have. I'm going to start off with the question from uh, Mr. Christopher Nong um, who, asks the, uh, who poses the following question. What role will education play in terms of pushing the green, for green economic development in South Africa? A very important question. Perhaps you should answer it, Prof. Duncan. <laughs> and our Vice Chancellor is here as well. I mean, education is imperative. I already showed that those workers that did not have enough education were the first ones to go. So, again, that just transition story that I mentioned is extremely important. Education and communication is also important to those communities that are going to be impacted. The, part of the reason why we have resistance is because we haven't explained educated communities in terms of at least what I've presented here. 
education itself, of course, uh, for instance, now I think about us in the University of Pretoria, allows us to have the opportunity for the future to not be affected by potential loss of jobs that happen in different sectors and so forth, allow us, of course, to uh, in other uh, different faculties in the university to, to come up with technologies that allow us, for instance, to perfect the greening of uh, renewables. We know that at the moment, one issue that is quite important is how do we store renewable energy? And I think with all those types of studies, with that education, it's absolutely important and, and eventually we'll get to that, shall we say, sweet spot where we are able to see that indeed uh, there is no threat whatsoever to converting and, and instead of phasing down mm. coal, is, is the language in COP26, we phase out call. Mm. So, so education is absolutely critical. And I, I would imagine that, um, that even at the level of, of um, uh, basic education, uh, primary school and high school, that one would have to start, um, I suppose, recalibrating curricula in order to, to push home the, the ideas that you have shared with us. Indeed, in, uh, because each one of us has responsibilities towards, in a small way, contributing towards a green economy. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Prof. Chitika Mabugo. Here's another question, and this one comes from Adrienne Harris. And the question is as follows. How much of the job losses in extractive industries is due to the move to, the green, to green energy, and how much is due to mechanization? That's a very difficult question, which uh, answer I do not have, because we have aggregate job losses. So we yeah. saw in extractive industries, that because we have reduced our coal-fired uh, uh, contributions, we see job losses because we're no longer in coal uh, mining, we're no longer in the usual ESCOM uh, uh, fire uh, coal, uh, coal-fired uh, production. So it's a combination of this. Mm -hmm. It's very easy for us to tease out uh, this in the models that we use, but as I stand here, I do not have an answer for that okay. specific uh, 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 question. No, no, certainly, uh, Prof. Chitiga Mabugo. Uh, do we have time for one more question, or do, do you have <laughs> enough energy left for another question? <laughs> I am very hot. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, uh, uh, there's something, that, uh, a question that relates to the issue of green bonds. Uh, do you want to speak about that for a moment, or...? Uh, it's not necessarily my area of yeah. expertise in green bonds, but what is the question? Um, um, how do we access green bonds for developmental purposes? Okay, so, so let me generally say that what we need is, is funding. That's one mm. issue that I mentioned. The, the recovery, the stimulus package by the president assumes that we would get financing. We saw at COP21 the promise of a 8.5 billion US dollars to South Africa for the greening ventures in, in South Africa. These are some of the available funding that is there. But of course it's not enough, it's not nearly enough. What we need is to have investors that are keen to come and assist us. We have said at COP26 and before, and I also agree, we need to have developed countries come to the party to assist us, to work with us in terms of uh, um, uh, developing the, the renewables in, in our countries. But as I say, I'm not, uh, in, my, my colleagues in the uh, uh, EMS who are in investment in finance are better able to answer these kinds of uh, green bonds. Well, I certainly understand the situation bit better after your explanation, Prof. Chitiga Mabugu. Uh, by the way, I have to acknowledge where that question comes from. It comes from Mr. Ivan Stienkamp. Um, but in any case, uh, Prof. Chitiga Mabugu, once again, um, thank you for doing this presentation. Um, and I think I'm going to hand over to the Vice Chancellor at this point. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this ends the expert lecture. I would like to thank very much our colleague, our expert tonight, Professor Margaret Chitiga Mabuku, for a very analytical, insightful, and, and policy-oriented and policy-driven uh, presentation. I think that in, in summation, one can say the following. Prof. Chitiga Mabuka says to us, the only way to sustainable futures is a strategic and intentional approach to greening our economy. 
I'd like to thank also my colleague, Professor Duncan, the program director for tonight, and also Professor Shitiga Mabugu, collaborators in the research that they are doing. She says there is an opportunity and that South Africa has the right attitude and commitments towards greening our economy. In order to save ourselves, we must save the planet. Thank you very much. Have a good night and wait for the next series next year.